Good afternoon uh, to everyone on the line, or good morning for those on the West Coast. We're going to uh, get started here, and thank you all for joining us and participating in today's webinar about litigation funding in the COVID era. I'm David Carter. I'm a partner at the Washington, D.C. office for Womble Bond Dickinson, and my practice focuses on the intersection of telecommunications policy and litigation. I also lead our firm's Telephone Consumer Protection Act defense practice. I'm joined today by my co-moderator and partner, Kathy Kinger, as well as a group of wonderful panelists that have uh, agreed to participate in the discussion today. Uh, so I'd like to start just by having Kathy uh, offer introductions as well. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, great to see you and to, to know that you're joining us today. Um, I'm Kathy Hanger. I am a business litigation partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Womble Bond Dickinson, and my practice focuses on the defense of companies um, sued in business-to-business -business disputes as well as uh, companies in government investigation matters. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, so we're joined today by a great group of panelists. I'm going to introduce them very briefly to you all. Um, and then they'll be able to talk a little bit more with you about their background and experiences as we proceed with the discussion today. Uh, so first, we're joined by Ted Farrell, uh, founder of Litigation Funding Advisors. Hello and welcome, Ted. Hey, thanks for having me. We are joined by Matt Reason, Vice President of Investments and Partnerships at LexShares. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, David. Happy to be here. And last, but certainly not least, uh, we have Ross Wiener with the Legal Director for Risk Settlements. Thank you for joining us as well, Ross. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> and we're going to go ahead and activate for the first part of today's discussion some, some slides that we've uh, made available. And we'll walk through those uh, with each of our presenters having an opportunity to present before we then open up for a, dis a moderated discussion with everyone today. So, on your screen is the contact information for today's presenters. We will also share this information with you again at the end of today's presentation uh, in case you want to reach out to any of the presenters for follow-up questions. I would also note that there is a poll that is available on the screen and it's uh, going to remain open for a few more minutes as people join today's webinar. We will then close the poll and you'll be able to see uh, aggregated results from all of the people that are participating in today's discussion. Today's webinar is part of a series of educational offerings being made available by the firm, Womble Bond Dickinson, to help businesses respond to and anticipate the changes that the coronavirus pandemic and associated stay-at-home orders are having on the way in which businesses operate. I encourage you to visit the firm's hub on its website that provides a variety of additional resources, including prior webinars that have already been hosted and information about upcoming webinars that may be of interest to you or your business. Given the economic consequences of COVID-19, businesses across the country are confronting a sometimes bleak new economic reality that requires companies to think carefully about the expenditure of resources and how to protect their vital cash flow from being unexpectedly diverted. Bringing or defending litigation in this environment may present unique challenges that we have not previously confronted. In my practice, where I defend companies in cases involving alleged breaches of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, we continue to see new putative class actions filed on a daily basis, often with no advance notice or warning to the companies that will have to defend that litigation. In an environment in which planning may be the key to some businesses' survival, 
unexpected class action litigation can have profound consequences. During today's discussion, we will explore third-party litigation funding and how it may be a tool that businesses can turn to if they need to pursue litigation to protect their rights but want to avoid the out-of-pocket expenses associated with legal fees. We will also discuss class action defense insurance, which may help companies defending litigation limit their exposure or provide greater certainty for budgeting purposes. We want today's discussion to be both useful and practical. Our panelists will try to provide both an overview of litigation funding, but also specifically address how COVID-19 is impacting the availability of funding and the process to obtain the funding. As the agenda indicates, we will have a brief presentation from each of our three panelists before turning over to Kathy Hinger, who will discuss some of the ethical issues that arise in the course of having or pursuing litigation funding. We will take questions from the audience throughout today's presentation. Your microphones are currently muted and will remain muted during the course of the discussion, but you can submit written questions using the Q&A feature located on the WebEx platform on the right side of your screen. Please include your name, company, and title with your question if you are comfortable with that information being shared with the audience. Otherwise, please indicate that you are submitting the question anonymously. Please remember that today's session will be recorded and posted on our website for future viewers to enjoy. So please refrain from sharing any information that would be considered confidential. Lastly, in today's environment, we are all adjusting to working from home and we realize that un sometimes unexpected technology issues do happen. While we don't anticipate any issues during today's presentation, if there are any issues that arise, please bear with us. We will get things back up and running as quickly as we can. So to kick us off for the first part of our discussion today, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Reason with LexShares. All right. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks to the Womble team for putting this together. And thanks for everybody who's joining today. And I am now taking control of the screen. Awesome. All right. Uh, well, look, my goal here in 10 minutes is to essentially be as useful as possible in articulating why and how and when litigation finance can be a useful resource. To give you some context, I will walk through what I'll call basics. I will touch on a little bit about lecture shares who we are, what we've done, you know, how we're unique in this marketplace. I will then touch on sort of the types of cases we look for and specialize in, what we look for from a criteria perspective, the process of obtaining financing, walk through some examples, and then lastly, I will touch on common structure, what essentially attorneys can expect and what clients can expect from a cost perspective if and when we ever do get to engage, at least here at lectures. All right, well, some of the basics to start. We are providing non-recourse capital, collateralized typically against a single case. So our model in terms of non-recourse, what does that actually mean? That means the client has no obligation to pay us back if the case is not successful. And in terms of what we're getting for that investment, it's obviously a portion of the recovery, and that is bespoke case by case. Just uh, really quick, actually, I am having control here or trouble controlling the slides. If you, uh, there we go. Uh, and then in terms of how it typically works, the deals we're doing, they are typically contracted through the client. So these are single case investments where the case itself is the only collateral. And then we are contracting through the client, even though the attorney does acknowledge that agreement with their signature. And most commonly, the financing is going to go directly or in a segregated account for the attorney to use for litigation fees and expenses. So that is what I would call the basics. I will elaborate more on that as we go. Now that we do have successfully the lecture slide up in front, just a little bit of information about who we are. We were founded in 2014. We are a lean team of 14. Uh, we have two offices. I am based here in Boston. If anyone on the call is from Boston today, I am 
coming to you here from Charlestown. And then in terms of our team in New York, that's actually where all of our legal folks are. Important to note that LexShares, all of our work underwriting-wise is done in-house. Uh, we have four former litigators on that team. They are led by our former chief, or now, or, excuse me, chief investment officer, uh, Max Volsky. Uh, and Max has been in the litigation finance industry so long, he's actually wrote a book, and you can search for it on Amazon. Uh, so in terms of what we're doing here, I would say by all public accounts, we are now the most active funder in the litigation space. We have funded over 100 deals. We have deployed over $70 million. And there's a few things we're doing that are a bit unique. I would say first, and this is actually the side that I am most focused on, which is origination. So we have an active team. We have four people that I manage that are solely focused on originating opportunities, cultivating relationships with attorneys and clients, and we rely on our Diamond Mind software, which is actually a proprietary algorithm created by our engineering team uh, that's used actually to scrape federal and state court dockets. And that is essentially what drives our outreach. It pulls on 24 different criteria and essentially helps us figure out which cases may or may not be worth reaching out to. Uh, so if anyone on a call or this call has gotten an email from us before, uh, I would not be surprised. Uh, secondly, what we're doing different is we have introduced litigation finance to what I would call the mid-market. Uh, so traditionally, folks think that litigation finance is only available at a huge number, you know, $100 million case seeking, you know, 5 to $10 million. That is not true at LexShares. Our minimum threshold is actually $2 million. Uh, so all we would be investing at a minimum $200,000. Uh, I'll talk more about this as we go, but typical ratio for litigation funders would be 10 to 1. So if someone, if you had a million dollar budget, we would need to see $10 million conservatively uh, in order to move forward. And just to understand how we assess the damages, we're not factoring in trebling or punitives or what you may be alleging in the complaint. Uh, we are essentially drilling down at a floor, compensatory damages, arguably a settlement value if and when we can obtain that. And that is what dictates how much we can invest. And then I would say lastly, how we invest. Our model is a bit different. We do have our own committed capital. Uh, but we are actually the first to create an online marketplace for litigation finance. Uh, so we have an accredited investor network of thousands of people. And on select investments, we will introduce those investments to that investment class. Uh, and if you've been on our email list or join it, you will notice these investments do go very, very quickly. It's a fascinating case study, uh, and I encourage you to do so. All right. In terms of what we are typically investing in, I covered this earlier, but our bread and butter, no question, are single case investments, commercial arena, breach of contract, trade secrets, squeeze outs. I would say at an extreme, it's David versus Goliath, but it certainly doesn't need to be. Uh, we do have additional offerings. I would say the one worth calling out is how we work with attorneys as the primary signator. This is where they will be essentially providing a portfolio of investments, and we will be collateralizing it across that entire contingency portion. Of our 100 plus investments, we've probably done this roughly five to 10 times, which means 90% of the time we're looking for a single case above $2 million, that being the threshold. Obviously, we're looking for strong merits, and I will touch on that a bit further. But here you can see that there's a wide array of what we invest in. I think I do have a slide moving forward that even breaks down out of our 100 where we've invested, what types, what stage. Uh, but we do invest, for instance, in intellectual property. That is something I'll likely touch on later, but due to COVID, we sort of put that on hold. Uh, you'll see international arbitrations. I, I think I see a question about arbitrations there. Uh, we certainly will fund arbitrations. International arbitrations are maybe a bit dicier in this landscape. And uh, you can also see some examples, which I know might be small on the screen. If you do go to our website, there is a case study section, which I think will highlight upwards of 10 investments with actually a lot more color than what you're seeing here. So in terms of what I mentioned here, in really in terms of a full breakdown, I think a couple of interesting things to note here, uh, the stage of investment. So we are agnostic regarding when we can get involved. You'll see there's almost 50% of our cases are in the discovery phase. You know, that's ultimately when usually expenses are starting to ramp. You know, cases might now have survived dispositive motions, which we like to see from a funding perspective. But you'll notice it's sort of spread across. Uh, most I want to highlight here is pre-litigation. We get a lot of interest pre-filing, and to be very upfront, that is something we'll happily entertain. 
even without a draft complaint, we would just need a memorandum to get started. And I'll walk through what that process looks like in a minute. Uh, and I thought actually interesting, just for our own edification, we put a lot of focus at lectures on federal cases. Even a lot of our outreach methods are, are really focused on federal cases. But technically, according to this graph, we funded more cases in state court than we have in federal. And then again, you can see here, wide array of damages does not need to be a massive case for us to get involved. And then an interesting array of case types, everything from whistleblower, soft IP, et cetera. All right, so the underwriting process, I will begin with the criteria in which we seek. First, I mentioned $2 million minimum threshold. Obviously, we're looking for highly meritorious claims, if and when possible. Certainly evaluating the strength of legal counsel, and from my view, how much risk legal counsel is willing to put in. And then I would say more than ever, especially in this environment, focusing on the defendant's ability to pay. Collection risk is a very large reason we end up rejecting cases. And now even in this environment, also evaluating the plaintiff's ability to potentially go bankrupt is something we're evaluating now as well. In terms of a process, I will run through this quickly. Someone like me is on the front end. Uh, so in order to actually get a claim evaluated, I want to make this very clear. There is not a lot of legwork for counsel or client. You know, with lex shares, arguably within a week, I can let you know if we have interest in that claim and arguably get the client a proposal to review. A call with me would typically begin the process or someone on my team. You know, that call can arguably last 10 minutes, no more than 30. I'm essentially just trying to evaluate the key criteria that I mentioned. And then from there, ideally, I just need publicly filed pleadings to get the process in motion. I would show that to our legal folks. They would do a preliminary review. And the outcome of that would really be three things. Sadly, we're not interested. Yes, we're very interested. And I would actually come with a proposal right out of the gate. Or we would learn, hey, we want to have a call with counsel to figure that out and then get to a proposal thereafter. And like share is a little bit different. We're not leading with LOIs or term sheets. If we are interested, we provide our full agreement. Uh, so this is ultimately a purchase and sale. 20 pages, obviously outline what the terms, the cost, et cetera, but also outline all of the fine prints associated with this transaction. If we can get that agreement executed, that would then begin a 30-day diligence process. And within that process, we have an obligation to tell you yes or no. If the answer is yes, we would quickly deploy the funds. David, if I'm tight on time here, let me know, but I will wrap up with this slide. Common funding structure, probably most interested, what does this actually cost clients? What are we expecting from counsel? In terms of what it really means for the client, again, fully non-recourse, we are taking the risk off the table, and we are essentially charging a multiple that increases over time. So in sort of short, what the client can expect to pay based on what we invest, here's a million dollar example, somewhere as low as a 2X multiple, if it takes upwards of, let's say, four years, maybe that multiple caps at 5X. So they are going to pay a multiple within that range. On the counsel side, you know, we are agnostic regarding what we can deal with from a structure perspective. But obviously, the, the larger the risk they're willing to take, typically the uh, more confident we are in the claim. Uh, but again, we're not focused on whether it's a 25% deferral or a 45% deferral. We're going to look at it case to case, depending on who counsel is. But it is obviously, or maybe not so obviously, important that counsel, let's just say we do a million dollar investment, agree not to withdraw from the case if and when our funding runs out. So that is the real expectation from counsel. We're looking for partners. We're going to align our risk, or excuse me, our interest, and we need them to take on the risk if and when the case is not resolved within our funding amount. So to recap, I would say from the client perspective, incredible resource to de-risk, obviously keep some capital on the balance sheet and focus on what you'd like to spend it on and not litigation. And from the attorney perspective, no question a valuable resource to take on claims you might not otherwise take on or avoiding sticky situations, especially in this environment where clients who might have been able to pay are no longer able to. And I will pause there. I'm sure there will be questions soon, uh, but I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. I actually am going to, because we do have a couple more minutes, I'm going to ask a couple follow-up or clarifying questions that I think might be useful for the audience. Um, you discussed the, that, um, in the slide that you have up currently talks about the attorneys or law firms uh, bearing part of the risk of a case. 
Could you talk a little bit about, you know, are there situations in which that require, is that a requirement? Is that a desirable but not a necessity? So could you talk a little bit more about what type of risk you would look for uh, if you considered the case to be a strong case with uh, a high likelihood of success and a, and a sizable damages pool? Uh, would you still require the attorneys and law firm to bear part of the risk? No, that, that's a great question, and I can flesh that out further. I, I would say the most common structures we're seeing are either a council was fully contingent on time and our funding would cover the expenses, or council would be partially contingent on time and our funding would cover that discounted fee plus expenses. That said, that is not necessary in every case Essentially, it does come down to the damage model and the budget. So back to sort of that 10 to 1 ratio, if we're looking at a $50 million case with a maybe, let's say, $1 to $2 million budget, we're a lot more flexible regarding what that risk essentially needs to be. So even in a situation where we would potentially do what I would just say is pure hourly, if the case is strong enough and the damage model supports it, we would entertain that structure, again, just understanding if the funding runs out, we would need counsel to defer above that investment amount. That is, I think, really the cornerstone of a litigation finance transaction with counsel. You know, whether we're paying at 600 an hour, 700 an hour, I think we're less concerned about that as long as we believe in the case and sort of counsel itself. Does that help? Okay. That is, uh, that's helpful, thank you. And you talked a little bit about, if, if I understood the process correctly, um, you would do an initial examination of a case. You would express that this is a case that you're either highly interested in or maybe potentially interested in, and that you might put a, a, a really a contract on the table, but that the execution of the contract would only serve to actually kick off then a 30-day due diligence period, if I understood that correctly. So could you talk a little bit about what happens between the time period in which a client has signed a letter of intent or a contract, I guess, depending on how you phrase that, and the time in which they actually know whether the funding will, in fact, be made available to them for the case. Yeah, no, absolutely. So one, objectively, if we do get to that stage where we have decided preliminarily we are interested and we get that agreement executed, it's about a 75% chance we would fund it. So that is objectively just across the board based on our data. In terms of what the process looks like, step one, we will get underwriters assigned to the case. So essentially the person that did the preliminary review and now one other will dig in for maybe two to three days after the agreement is executed. They will ultimately spin out a diligence checklist. So essentially we've already reviewed X, we need Y in addition to essentially really begin and complete this process some of that is going to be stock, like we'll run background checks on the clients, and then others will be custom to the case itself, strategy, et cetera. We will put that checklist in client and counsel's hands. Ideally, they revert with that information quickly, and once they do, we'll spend a couple days reviewing it, and then that really begins the dialogue. We'll do a phone call with counsel. We'll do a phone call with the client. If it's straightforward and we have all the information we need, we certainly don't need the full 30 days. That is typically a max time period. Uh, but, you know, in this environment, it's hard to maybe go quicker than that. But let's just assume we get everything quickly, clients are fast through the process. After a few phone calls, we can give a notice of approval or not. And if the answer is yes, funds are deployed within 7 to 14 business days. And if the answer is no, we try to say it as quickly as possible. Is that helpful? Okay. That is. And, and during that time period in which the con uh, uh, contract has been signed and you're performing the due diligence, is the client or the firm able to continue soliciting offers from other funders during that time period? So technically they would not. The agreement would imply exclusivity over that diligence period. Sort of the justification is we don't wanna be obviously spending our resources and putting that much time into something if and when obviously there's other conversations going on. So that's why we'll put all of our fine print out. Obviously, while we're negotiating the agreement, it is not exclusive. But once the client decides these terms, these rates, et cetera, are amenable to my team, we would want to be exclusive over that final diligence period. And if we obviously decline to move forward, 
that diligence period will end, or excuse me, the exclusivity period will end even if, you know, we're on day 17. Okay. And so just to kind of recap, for, for Lex shares, um, which seems like it maybe moves faster than others in the ecosystem, you're probably looking at a period of approximately 60 days you know, for successful funding from the time they sort of first express interest to the, t to the completion of the contract and then the diligence period and then ultimately funding. Is that, is that about around 60 to 75 days? Exactly. I, I typically say 60 to 90 just to give sort of a, a full ballpark. Okay, excellent. Uh, so thank you for that. We'll come back uh, later with some questions around how COVID-19 is impacting this process for, for LEC shares and others in the industry. But uh, now I want to turn it over to Ted Farrell, who's going to discuss what he does. He has experience coming out of uh, both a law firm as a litigator, then working directly with a funder, and now he's established a brokerage company that helps to make matches between law firms and litigation funders. So I'm going to turn it over to Ted. Great, and thanks again, uh, David and Kathy, and everyone at Womble for inviting me. Um, and as David hinted, um, you know, that is right. And I think my, my background is, is worth talking about for just a minute because I think it sort of informs what I can do. So I started where a lot of you are now, which is maybe you funded one case or maybe you are thinking about funding. And I remember the first funding proposal I worked on, I was an associate at Winston & Strawn and I learned about this world. This is back in 2014. This is a long time ago in this industry. Uh, Many of the senior people that I were working for had the type of clients uh, that needed funding. And um, at a certain point, we decided to leave Winston. Uh, and I became a partner at a boutique law firm. And most of my practice for about four years was spent litigating cases that were funded by third parties. And during that time, I got to know all sorts of people in the industry and saw a big opportunity there. Uh, and I was lucky enough to take a job at Banning Capital, where I was a managing director. Um, my job was much like Matt, origination, first and foremost, and then also underwriting uh, and negotiation. And then when Bannon was acquired uh, by a large hedge fund, uh, I started this brokerage firm. And what I'm really trying to do in the role that I, I think I can play is, because I've been in the seat of most of the people on this call saying, there's this great case if only I can get it funded, I have a pretty good understanding of that, but then I also understand what Matt's dealing with, right? And what are the commercial realities and what do I need to see so that I can tell the people I work with, you know, I'm going to put my name on this. This is a really important investment. And so, you know, I have a couple of slides here and I, I promise I try not to do death by PowerPoint, but, you know, one thing a funder can help with is, you know, a lot of times you're in your law firm, the people you're speaking with, many of them are former attorneys and they speak that attorney language. But the most important thing for them is, is this a viable and attractive commercial transaction for us? That is the question they're gonna to have to answer. So when you think of taking a case of a client comes into Womble and you guys are writing up your memo, the first thing you're gonna say is, okay, do we have a statute of limitations problem? When do we have to file this? You're gonna look at the claim. Well, for the funder, the first question for the funder is usually the following. Who is the defendant and can they pay? And if the answer is they can't pay, we stop. And then question number two is, okay, if we know who they are and they can pay, how much would it be? And then if it's not enough, we stop. And then we get into the merits. So the funder has to look at it in a very different way. And so, you know, one of the things I can do is help attorneys to understand how do I put this case what are the parts of this that I emphasize to help them, first of all, to get their attention at the outset? Because as Matt alluded to, it's a tremendous amount to underwrite these cases. It's a tremendous amount of work because it's a non-recourse capital. So if a funder gives you five, six, seven, eight million dollars to do your case and it's going to be non-recourse, you can only imagine the level of work put into that to say yes to that. And so I think that what I can do is help you show them where to look, what to look for, and why your case is worth their time. Another thing I can do is a broker can frankly take a lot of the day-to-day -day off of the attorney. 
anyone on this um, webinar who has either funded a case or tried to get a case funded knows it's a tremendous amount of work. And the world doesn't stop when you're seeking funding. The deadlines in your other cases don't stop. Your clients do not stop emailing you. And so your day job where you have a professional responsibility to do the highest quality work doesn't stop. And so a broker uh, can do a lot of that work for you. Um, but third is, you know, we have two sides of the point. So Matt was talking about how they'd like to see firms taking risk. And I agree that, you know, people want to see firms taking risk. However, in some firms, maybe you can go down to 70%. And if you go down to 70% of your fees, maybe you only need the head of your practice group to sign off. But if you have to go down to 50%, you got to go to the contingency committee and that can be tough and that can get political. So a broker can really help sort of bridge that gap and get a particular case uh, where it needs to be. Uh, the second thing a broker can do is help you to understand where the money's coming from for your case. Uh, and there are all different ways this happens. So there are some funders who actually have a fund, meaning a pool of capital sitting accounts that is raised and committed and they can deploy directly. And that can be very attractive because a lot of times those pools of capital are large. However, there are sometimes when a particular case falls outside of the mandate that they gave their investors. And if it's not within the mandate of their investors, even if they think it's a winner, they can't do it. The second is there's some funders that really are more sales agents, and that's either for a hedge fund or for a large institutional investor. And that has some positives because hedge funds have a ton of money. And so if there is a $10 million case, the capital is there. However, what can happen is you go all the way through the deal with the people who you think are the principals and the decision makers, and what you find out when they say yes is, now we have to go explain to our hedge fund why we should do the deal. And a lot of times you can get a yes from who you think are the principals and a no from the hedge fund. And then there are others who raise it on a per deal basis. And that can be tremendous because all deals are different some deals are very attractive, and the people who do it that way have a track record of doing it that, that, that way. However, there is going to be a risk that the funds may not be there. So different cases, I think, call for different kinds of capital sources. And as a broker who deals with many of the commercial funders on a routine basis, I can give that insight and say, you know, for this particular case, I think we want to go to this kind of a, of a capital source. And then I think the last thing is uh, different funders have different risk profiles, right? They're just, they're just different. They have different philosophies. And, you know, think of it like a movie studio. Some studios want to spend $250 million on a superhero movie because they think they can turn it into $2 billion. And others want to do a smaller movie with a $10 million budget, and they want to turn that into 15 or 20 so depending what kind of case you have, there are different funders that, judging on the subjective criteria that they use and the kind of cases they like, are better for your particular case. And what a broker can do is try to funnel you to the people who would probably be more interested in your case, regardless of its merits, but just because subjectively it's there. Um, other funders, some funders move very fast. I think lex shares move very fast. Others move very slow. Now, for certain cases, maybe moving slow isn't a problem if you can get better terms. But for other cases, you'd rather get it done in 60 days, even if the terms aren't as good, as opposed to waiting four months. And, you know, brokers can give you very candid advice based on experience of what it's going to take. But the last thing is, you know, brokers have their ear to the ground. And brokers know things that you wouldn't know in your day-to-day -day law practice. And I'll just give you an anecdote. I'm working on a large international arbitration, and I called a very trusted counterparty about a deal. And this person said, I think it's a great deal. And just so you know, we lost a huge arbitration two weeks ago, and heads are going to roll, and I couldn't get this to go anywhere in the next six months. You could go somewhere else. Now, I can assure you that's not on their website, right? They don't, they're not advertising that. But it's sort of that kind of intelligence can really um, 
can really just be useful because the most important thing is that your case gets funded. And I think a broker can really give you sort of the insight and the intelligence uh, and advice of how best to do it, how best to do it in a way that's going to work for the firm. And so that's really the extent of my, you know, overview of the broker and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Ted. Could you um, maybe just talk for one minute before we turn it over uh, to Kathy and Ross? Uh, could you talk a little bit about your due diligence? How do you decide whether it's a case that you actually would want to represent and try to seek funding for? So what I do is, you know, I understand that my value is only there if I'm respected by the capital sources that I work with. and you know, because I was lucky enough to be at a global funder, the criteria that I use is I say to myself, if I've looked at the material, I've spoken with counsel, I've looked at documents, if this looks like the kind of case that I would spend time and resources on in their role, right? If I was sitting in their chair, I would do it. So what are the real damages? You know, as, as Matt said, collection risk can be a problem. So if someone comes in with a great case, but I know there's not going to be a collection, I'll just say, you know, we're not going to get this funded. Or, you know, sometimes people have done little to no work on the damages. They just say, oh, well, there are a lot. And what I say is, you know, you're asking for millions and millions and millions of dollars here. This thing has to be in the kind of shape where a funder is going to use it. So, you know, I really, I don't send things out that are not worked up and that haven't been scrubbed and that I do not think, you know, fit within the criteria. Now, look, that doesn't mean I don't help people work it up, but, you know, if someone calls and says, oh, my client had their contract breached, can we just start making calls? You know, there has to be a lot of work done uh, to really show people that there's thought in how the case is going to work. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Okay, so we've been talking so far about third-party funding for use on the plaintiff side of a case, um, but Ross with Risk Settlements is going to talk to us about another facet of third-party funding, um, which maybe is not as, as prevalently known. Um, when I learned about it, I thought it was fascinating and so really wanted to share this other defense side of third-party funding resource with everyone, um, bringing greater certainty and the predictability of the cost of, of the defense side of litigation is something that we always struggle with, and it's very challenging, especially when there's a class action settlement. Um, so Ross is going to talk to us about really two facets of the uh, defense side insurance, both the class action settlement insurance and litigation buyout insurance. And so, Ross, I'll turn it over to you to start us, uh, to start us off and to uh, kick us off with the class action settlement insurance, how it works and what risk settlements does. Great. Well, thank you, Kathy and David and the Womble team for hosting this. Uh, weirdly enough, it feels good to put a tie on again, so I guess thanks for giving me that opportunity today. Um, but uh, it's great to be with all of you, and I'm happy to share some thoughts on what Risk Settlements does. And like Kathy said, I'd like to break it down into two parts. One is uh, the class action settlement insurance, which we call CASI, and the second is the litigation buyout insurance. But first, let me just talk a little bit about the company, kind of what uh, prompted its founding and, and what you know our ethos is. First and foremost, so the company was founded about seven years ago, and the goal of the company was to be a uh, risk uh, solution to, to clients and to defendants mainly in class action litigation. How do we help them manage their risk better? And so the first inefficiency that we saw and thought to try to cure has to do with the class action space. And that's with respect to settlements where there's a claims made settlement done. But of course, the client's most important question all of the time is how much is this really ultimately going to cost? And so what we try to do, and what we have been doing now for about seven years, is solving that question. So for claims-made settlements in the, in the uh, class action space, 
what we do is we work with clients. We, we sign up a, a consulting agreement with the clients at no cost to them. We discuss the case. We discuss what they're looking to do from a settlement perspective, what's going to help them meet their business objectives. And then we try to understand the case and understand what type of settlement in terms of the benefit paid out to the class could work. And then ultimately, we work up for them in a fairly short time frame. And it can be as short as a day or two, actually, what ultimately a premium would look like for them to buy an insurance product that would cover all of the claims that come in on a claims-made settlement. And, and so you know, in short, what, what that does is it allows clients to know exactly the cost of their settlement without having to wait for the preliminary approval process, the final approval process, all of the claims to be in accounting. They can purchase that settlement insurance product, pay the one-time premium, have insurance coverage for all of the claims that ultimately come in, and you know, allow them to benefit from the certainty. Now, on the, on the Cassie side, of course, each policy is, is bespoke, as I think you know, Matt mentioned with his case, the same is true for us. Um, this is an insurance product that, you know, just to dispel any, uh, any thoughts, this is an insurance product that is purchased not before you are sued, but it's actually purchased you know, co coinciding with the settlement of your case. So it's not something that you need to have coverage for in advance of a lawsuit or in advance of defending a lawsuit. Rather, it's something that you get and what we do is when we work with you or work with a client on pricing, we, it's a very iterative process. So we can kick around some ideas among, you know, between us and the defendant. But ultimately, those ideas don't mean anything unless and until they cross the transom and the plaintiff you know, ultimately agree to a settlement. And so when the benefit... Uh, Ross, uh, sorry to interrupt. We're having, a few people are having difficulty hearing. If you could maybe just hold it a little bit closer, that might be helpful. Sure. Is this better? Thanks. Sorry about that. Yeah. It is, yes, thank you. Okay. And so as I was saying, it's a it's an iterative process with respect to funding and what we do is we, we look at the settlement, we come up with some structures, and then once the defendant is negotiating a settlement with the plaintiff and the terms change, the defendant comes back to us and it can be the day of a mediation or a settlement conference and we work new um, markups, new term sheets kind of in real time so that the defendant in the case always knows exactly uh, how much it's going to cost them to settle. And so what we think that does is provide, you know, certainty and certainly cost certainty to, to, to defendants and gives them another other slew of benefits that I will talk about in a bit. Now, the second type of product that, that we offer and, um, is what we call litigation buyout insurance. And the, the way this product came to be is that we realized Look, on the one hand, we were providing risk transfer um, at the very end of a case, right, when the, when the settlement is in place and, and their clients are trying to get understanding as to what exactly it's going to cost them. But that's not where every client's biggest need is. In fact, sometimes the biggest issue that clients have and, and what we've been seeing to date is they're in the midst of a, a class action litigation, obviously not of their choosing, but they're also, let's say, the target of a potential M&A or they're trying to do a financing and there are red flags that are coming up. And I'll, I'll use the M&A as an example because it's the one we see most frequently. Companies trying to be sold and the buyer is looking at the target, here the defendant in a class action litigation, and seeing a, let's call it a TCPA case, one of those that David and, and Kathy do so often where there's a potential statutory damages figure that could be startling and would certainly trigger a red flag in any memo from the buyer's counsel, and that these types of litigations are actually holding up transactions because they're presenting the, 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 the target with a few you know, really bad options, right? One is to maybe settle a case in an inopportune time. Uh, another is to have an escrow that could be considered huge in any transaction. Uh, or the third is potentially to blow up any M&A deal because the, the, the two parties can't get comfort on it. The seller thinks that the litigation risk is, is not, you know, as bad and can be mitigated, and the buyer, all they see is the potential statutory damages out there, and they're incredibly concerned that, uh, that you know, once they acquire this company, they're going to own, you know, a really bad litigation risk. And so with litigation buyout insurance, it, it really is the flip side of the coin to, uh, you know, the plaintiff side funding, 
where you come to us with a case and you explain, you know, we, understand, we have to get an understanding of what's going on in the matter, uh, what stage of the case, where are you litigating it, uh, what are the potential damages, who are you up against, and we, we run that through our system. We, we do an, our own underwrite in-house, and we ultimately come out with, again, you know, what's going to be the premium for an insurance policy that will cover a certain amount of the exposure. Every insurance policy has to have an endpoint, so it'll be, at the end of the day, a policy that covers um, defense costs and judgments, and it gives the client in that situation certainty, and it allows them, you know, in the M&A context that I was talking about, it gives them the ability to close a deal that could be, you know, critical for, for the folks there and, and critical for the employees to get the deal done, but otherwise wouldn't because of this, you know, existential threat by a, by a class action litigation. So that's the very kind of short uh, of what we do from a, a class action settlement uh, insurance side and the litigation bio insurance side. But let me turn it back to, to Kathy to see if she has any specific questions. Yeah, Ross, on the litigation buyout insurance, can you explain to us, because we think we're really smart at the law firm and our clients ask us for budgets and we give them budgets and sometimes we can hold to them and sometimes our opposing party does things that are off the wall um, that we don't expect or the judge issues an order that does something that increased our costs. How is it that risk settlements is able to manage the defense costs of litigation and and what is it that the clients, um, why would the clients um, believe that risk settlements could manage those, those costs um, in the same, you know, differently than the law firms might be doing it? And if they, they do engage in the litigation buyout insurance, can they keep their lawyer or, or is it separate lawyers? How does that work? It's a great question, Kathy. And, and so let me start with the last question first, which is, you know, can they keep their own lawyer? One of the things that, that it's critical to understand is risk settlements is not, you know, we're not going to be defending the case, right? We're not a law firm, we're, we're a company. And so what we like to do, and I think much like uh, Matt talked about during his part of the presentation, is we want to partner, you know, with the firms that are, that are controlling the defense of this case. And so, and so when we take on an obligation, a litigation buyout insurance obligation, you know, we want to be, we're, we're proactively working with the firms to understand um, exactly uh, what the contours are of the defense, what the agreement is, and to see if there are ways with, with either the existing firm or potentially a new firm to handle the defense in a way that we think all of everyone's interests are aligned. And so, you know, it doesn't, if, if we invest in a case, right, to, to ensure a defense and the defendant and its firm are burning through millions of dollars in defense costs, um, a month, you know, it, it makes the proposition very hard to, to be one that's, that's profitable for, for all parties. But if the defense firm in the case is willing to work, you know, whether it's on a reverse uh, success fee or a contingency fee of some sort or some modified, you know, reduced rates, but with, you know, potentially a success kicker, um, there are ways that we think, you know, there are incentive structures so that all of the all of the parts are aligned to get to an outcome that's beneficial for all parties. Ashley, if you can hear me, it looks like we're getting some comments from the audience that sound has been lost. Um, so I'm not sure if we should continue on or just take a break for just a moment. I got another uh, indication the audio is out on the webinar. We get a message okay. to all of the participants really quickly that we're fixing that? Yes. Hold tight. I can hear you okay, Kathy. Yeah, I think the panelists can hear each other, but the attendees can't hear. Good thing you made that comment at the beginning, David, about how sometimes there's little tech glitches. Ashley, I'll hold until you tell me you think it's fixed. Sounds great, thank you.
if a few attendees could put in the Q&A box whether y'all can hear us or not, that would be great. And Kathy, I am getting some emails that audio is fine for some participants. And it looks like the WebEx dropped for maybe those that are listening through their computer system. So do so you recommend that those people dial in to the dial-in number? Yes. For the yes. audio? Yes. Hold on. All right, some of the internal Womble people are messaging me that there's volume now, some that, that lost it. Wonderful. I say let's continue. Um, we are recording this, and if we need to, we can send the recording to everyone, and they can pick up where their audio left off. Okay, let's do that so we don't waste too much time. Um, one of those tech glitches that David warned us about in the beginning, because then we had that conversation. Um, and Ashley, if we have a way to send a chat to all the attendees about dialing in, if they, over the um, hard phone line number, if they're still having trouble hearing, if they were originally on the, they're listening through their computer, maybe you can send that out to all the participants on the chat. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, great, thank you so much. All right, so um, I guess, Ashley, if we can move back to um, switching the slides over to, to me at this point, we got a little sidetrack there. Sorry about that. Okay, so I wanted to spend, this isn't a CLE, right? It's a webinar, we wanna provide you information and, and resources as our clients and, and companies are looking for creative ways to protect their cash flow, um, even though the world of litigation is continuing to go on and I'm not seeing any drop and the number of cases that are filed in our local courts and we get our daily report. So litigation is carrying on, notwithstanding the coronavirus and um, anything that's happening in the economy. Um, so we understand that you might be getting hit with these things and we want you to, to have the information about these alternative funding sources. But I know a great hesitancy that a lot of people have is how do I do this and not run afoul of the ethics rules and how do I do this without waiving privilege? Because as you just heard, there's a tremendous amount of information sharing that needs to go back and forth between the third party funders and counsel and the clients, um, which weaves this whole web of, web of ethics and discoverability, which could be its own CLE in and of itself. And so rather than trying to tackle all of that, I'm gonna just go through and flag and highlight the issues for you so that you sort of know where they're headed and you've got a little bit of a checklist uh, of what you should be looking at and thinking about if you do pursue third-party funding. And I'm happy to share more detailed resources with anyone after this program, um, whether inside the firm or externally. Um, but the first consideration is the ethical considerations. There certainly are a number of ethics rules that are implicated by the transactions that a lawyer would be engaging in with by and on behalf of their client with this third party financer. And I will say that the ethics rules are, have gone through various stages and levels of evolution. Um, some of the rules are um, anticipating third party litigation financing now. Some of them are completely bereft of any indication of how a, uh, a particular state's bar would interpret whether a funding agreement complies with the ethics rules. Some of the revisions are being buried in comments that may not be very obvious. So it's definitely a very fluid process. And so it's important going into uh, third party funding that the lawyer involved be familiar with the, uh, what the rules are in their particular jurisdiction. And I think it's just as important now, if you're thinking about third party funding, when you're choosing the, the jurisdiction, if you're gonna be a plaintiff, where you're filing your case, your choice of venue, what your choice of law is gonna look like. Um, the, the third party funding rules and opinions can be just as important, I think, as the substantive law that you're looking at when it comes to the success 
of your case. And that's something that um, needs to get rolled into your, your analysis and your pitch to someone like Matt or Ted when you're looking for the funding. Um, so there's a common theme, though, that a lot of these ethics issues can be tackled and secured. You just need to be familiar with what they are. So starting just sort of chronologically, you've got Rule 1.6, the confidentiality of information. You have that obligation to your client to maintain their confidences. But there's an exception if you have informed consent from your client. So written informed consent, written, is always the preferred method. And then you've got the conflicts of interest rules um, when you've got a current client and you don't want to do anything that will materially limit the lawyer's responsibilities to a third person um, in any way, so that rule is implicated, but can be tackled with informed consent uh, in writing with the client. There's the rule on client-lawyer transactions, and the informed consent in writing, again, is necessary and full disclosures. Um, and in that regard, Rule 1.8, um, F, deals explicitly with the accepting of compensation from a third party other than a client. And we've been doing this for a long time. It's not uncommon that lawyers will receive payment for a client's representation from uh, an uncle or a parent or a business partner, things like that. So it's just been a matter of trying to translate that to the third party um, funders uh, sphere. And it's got to come along with things like the transaction cannot interfere with the independence of the lawyer's professional judgment. It can interfere with the lawyer-client relationship. Um, and you can't be disclosing the client's confidential information without their informed consent. So when you get all these protections rolled into your agreement, and Matt talked about, for example, you know, the preliminary agreement and then the due diligence agreement, there have to be appropriate NDAs, confidentiality, and your client's knowledge and participation in these agreements. And the agreements are made to comply with these rules so that you're not ceding control over the case and the litigation um, to the third party funder, and that's a very important element of it, um, the control. Trying to take over the slide here, Ashley. There we go. Ashley, I don't seem to have control over the slide. Can you advance me to the next slide, Ashley? Okay. Um, rule 1.5, the safekeeping of property is implicated by uh, the use of a third party, so that's all of your trust account rules apply to the funds that you're receiving through the litigation funder. Um, and interestingly, in North Carolina, I know we have a lot of our friends from North Carolina on this call, North Carolina didn't amend its Rule 1.15, um, but it included in its comments a definition that the definition of an intermediary um, through whose hands your uh, trust account funds may pass, they've in defined that to include a litigation funder. Um, so that really brings into play the notion that there is a contemplation that litigation funding may occur and that it's acceptable and that it's okay, although there is not an express amendment to any of the other rules um, governing um, ethics and the litigation funding. So that's one example of where some sort of tacit approval of the use of litigation funding and the ethics rules has been buried in the comments. Um, Rule 2.3, evaluations for use by third persons. Again, the rules prohibit certain disclosures by counsel, absent the informed consent of client. Um, and then Rule 4.1 and 8.4 go to the truthfulness and statements made to others. So that means that lawyers, in talking with someone like Matt or Ted or Ross, we have to be mindful of that rule as well because we can't be puffing up our case. We can't be make, making material omissions about our case um, or fraudulently or being accused of fraudulently inducing an investment where there's an issue. Um, and probably one of the most interesting things on the um, ethics front is Rule 5.4, which goes to the professional independence of a lawyer. That, that rule has been 
invoked um, because it typically prohibits a lawyer or a law firm from sharing a legal fee. So it's really got to be looked at whether or not you're sharing a contingent fee or whether or not it's a um, legitimate means of, that doesn't violate public policy of funding cases. And the New York City Bar assembled a, recently assembled a committee to take a look at this issue. And they came out with a 90-page report in March that I think is really going to be the thought leadership for the ethics um, and, and litigation finance. And they recommended that the ethics rules should be amended to explicitly permit lit third-party litigation funding agreements. And they rejected uh, efforts to make mandatory disclosures of litigation funding agreements. There's been some courts that have done that. Um, there was an opioid uh, litigation that's pending in Ohio where there was a, a court order issued that everyone had to disclose to the court whether they were using third-party litigation funding. The New York City Bar Report is pretty progressive in, in um, protecting the privacy of those relationships. Um, and so we'll have to see if that results in actual changes to the ethics rules that other states start to follow and adopt. But things to keep your eye on. Um, Ashley, if you can advance to the next slide. Then there's obviously the discovery issues. Um, you've got the attorney-client privilege. As a general matter, the attorney-client privilege has not been upheld as a means of protecting disclosure of your litigation funding agreement or the communications related to it because the attorney-client privilege is between the attorney and the client. And even though there's been some applications of the common interest privilege exception or the agency exception to attorney-client privilege, generally courts are not going to uh, protect your litigation funding exchange based on attorney-client privilege alone unless you have some other reason to claim that the content is work product. On the other side, work product, though, has been a uh, very prevalently respected doctrine when it comes to litigation funding materials. Um, because the litigation funding materials are created in anticipation of litigation or because of litigation and typically include a lot of mental impressions and thoughts, um, if you can claim work product over the material that you're exchanging, with your third-party funder or your um, risk settlement insurer, then you're going to be able to protect that from discovery. But make no mistake, challenges are out there. Parties are trying to get this stuff. Um, the, the opinions are evolving, but, you know, they're only five or ten years old and they're sort of a smattering around the country. Um, what seems to work best is if you've got a nice, solid non-disclosure agreement or a confidentiality agreement that you can point to and you show to the court, my sharing of this information with my funder was intended to remain secret and we have outlined that it is purely for the purpose of this litigation. And that seems to really be one of the, the strongest ways to protect the work product. Um, there's been some relevance challenges to, and some of them are successful, some of them are not. Um, those are really across the board um, and I would say an unreliable means of protecting your um, communications. So, for example, there's been a, if there's a case where there was a confidentiality agreement over some communications, but there were some conversations with a few funders or um, oral communications with a potential financier that were not solidified with a confidentiality agreement, um, those may not be protected. Um, and then sort of the finalist challenge that's been out there on these is champerty and maintenance, which is probably not something most of us have come across much in our practices, but there's some archaic uh, criminal statutes out there that prohibit uh, champerty and maintenance, and some states have recognized that in a civil context, which basically prohibits the meddling in a cause of action by a unrelated third party um, seeking to take a portion of the proceeds of that litigation. And there's a, a fairly well-recognized Western District of North Carolina decision that came out of a bankruptcy court um, where a agreement was not approved because it was challenged as uh, champerty. However, it was really, that decision was really embedded in the content of the agreement because it ceded too much control over the litigation to the funder. 
Um, there are other cases that have really backhanded a champerty and maintenance challenge. And so I think you'll find that our, our friends who are the funders, um, they know how to structure the contract so that they're not exerting so much control that they run afoul of these issues. If you can go to the next slide, Ashley. So the best practices really as you're entering into these things to know to hit your ethics and your discovery is, is have your written NDA or confidentiality agreement. Get your informed consent in writing from your clients. Um, don't share exclusively attorney-client privilege information with your funder or your insurer um, unless it's also covered by work product. And just you really have to consult your local rules and authorities on this. So with that, I'd like to, um, Ross, maybe you can kick us off on talking a little bit about how your um, agreements um, comply with the ethics and the discovery rules and what you do um, to ensure that your clients are comfortable, that they're not going to have any of these problems because I think we want to make sure that everybody knows as they look for creative new ways to fund their cases that, they're, that this is something that has been um, conquered and we, we know how to get around it and that you'll work as a partner with the clients on this. Yeah, it's a great question. So, so first of all, you know, it's very important, as you alluded to, to understand the jurisdiction in which you are litigating the case. Uh, various jurisdictions differ. North Carolina has that one outlier decision, but other courts have been far more favorable to it. And so you've got to understand exactly where you are, right? If you're in front of that same bankruptcy court judge in North Carolina, you might not want to try that type of move again. But if you're somewhere else, you're going to have a lot more comfort based on the case law. Um, number two, um, obviously we always tell the, the defendants that we're working with to consult with their own lawyers to understand the risk. We, we have an understanding on our end, we share our understanding with them, but we you know, are not representing them in a legal capacity, so we want them to have that same type of comfort from their own counsel. And then three, you know, going back to the slide that you just had up on the various forms of protection with respect to disclosing of information and whether you know, you're looking to protect it under attorney-client uh, attorney protections or work product protections, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head, right, that attorney-client is not a good way to defend against the disclosure to a third party where it's almost an absolute, you know, waiver of the, of the attorney-client protection. But on the attorney work product front, it's a completely different uh, calculation. I was going back through my notes and found a decision from 2014 uh, in the Northern District of Illinois, Doe v. Society of the Missionaries of the Sacred Heart. And there, you know, the court raised a point that you know, I think is worthwhile with sharing, which is that um, you know, work product protection is only waived by disclosure to a third party when that disclosure, quote, substantially increases the opportunities for potential adversaries to obtain the information. And that's you know, one of the critical contexts here with work product, which is that when you're working with, you know, whether it's a funder on the plaintiff side or an insurance product on the defense side, those, the information that you're sharing with those parties should not have any risk of going to the adversary in litigation. And that's you know, usually accomplished through a strong NDA or confidentiality agreement on the outs, you know, at the outset. But you know, to, to put a fine point on it, you know, the court in that same case noted that you know, litigation financing companies have self-interested reasons to protect work product from disclosure because if they didn't, it would, quote, surely result in the inability to attract clients in the future. And so that's something I think Matt would certainly agree with. But, you know, you've got to be careful. You've got to understand the jurisdiction which you're in, and you've got to have good, you know, counsel understanding those issues too so that everyone gets to the right place. Uh, great. Thank you uh, for all the panelists for your discussion points. We wanted to shift gears into uh, actually talking a little bit more about how COVID-19 is impacting the litigation funding environment. And uh, before we do that, I just want to remind all the audiences, audience participants, that you can submit written questions to the Q&A feature. And we have one question that I think we can hit very quickly, um, which is, is third-party litigation funding available also for arbitration matters? So maybe uh, Ted and Matt, you could speak a little bit about that just very briefly. Sure. So uh, this is Ted. Um, international arbitration has actually been uh, heavily a part of the funding world, actually for a lot longer than U.S. litigation. Uh, you know, third-party funding started in Australia and then the U.K. And so 
certainly in international arbitration, it's actually much more developed and it's very common there. And then, you know, of course, for, you know, regular commercial arbitration, uh, it's certainly available there as well. And, you know, they, they all have different dynamics, but certainly there are a lot of funders who spend a lot of time on, um, on international arbitration uh, and then commercial arbitration as well. Matt, anything unique on that issue with LexShares? I would echo what Ted said. It, it is fascinating to me from my perspective how many dollars are invested in international arbitrations and how large those budgets are. You know, I think collection concerns are larger in, in that arena than normal. Uh, we have invested in one international arbitration matter out of ICSID. Uh, and like Ted said, we're, we're certainly interested in more commercial, AAA, et cetera, arbitrations. But especially now, you know, investor state disputes, et cetera, th these are not a focus for us for the time being. Okay. Ross, on the defense side, are you involved at all in, in defending or providing insurance for defense and arbitration matters, or is it purely within the court system? No, we, we certainly have, have um, looked at opportunities involved in, in arbitrations, and, um, you know, I, I can't say I, more frequently than not we are in the court system, but we certainly look at, at cases that are in arbitration to, to help with the risk transfer. Great. Okay, so the question that we have for each of you is what trends or issues are you seeing right now? We've been in our sort of home quarantine mode for a little over a month now. Some cities are starting to try to emerge and uh, send people back to work. Others are going to continue in this, in this uh, process for a while. We see courts kind of acting in different ways as well. We see some courts that have continued to push out deadlines on a rolling basis and are not uh, engaging anything other than emergency activities, while we see other courts that are continuing apace with discovery. Um, and, and also hearings, even if they're on a remote or telephonic basis. So how is this current environment already impacting litigation funding? How do you anticipate it will, uh, will impact litigation funding in the, in the weeks and months to come? And are there any specific changes that you think really impact the dynamics for which types of cases are going to be able to, to receive litigation funding if they desire to seek it. So that's the, the topic, and I think what I'll do is I'll let Ted kick us off on this discussion from his, from his perspective. Sure. So I think the first thing that this crisis has, has really hammered home is, you know, even when you're working in a firm, you really forget that it's a cash business, right? And you know, even in firms with hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, I mean, there is a real cash crunch. And so a few things that I've seen are for firms that were on the fence about taking litigation funding, I think that has really changed. Uh, I think there are matters because I have, you know, frankly worked on some where there are um, people from law firms that everyone on this one would have heard of who have been on a contingency matter and are now looking for a funder to buy in because, you know, collecting a few million dollars in cash this year for some firms that have been really hard hit and are laying off people is more attractive, frankly, than the chance to turn it into four or five million dollars a few years later. So what I have really seen is, you know, the value of this money, of this certainty is greater in this time. Um, you know, a lot of firms also, uh, and especially a big law firm, that some of the, you know, some attorneys use funding, if there's a real cream of the crop uh, contingency matter, for example, let's just say, and I'll just use Wombo as an example, let's just say one of your top five blue chip clients who you work in every practice group has a $500 million case. It's going to cost $20 million. You and your management might decide, you know what, for this client in this case, we're willing to, you know, over the next four years, risk $5 million of our own money because the upside is just massive. And I think even in some of those cases, firms are saying, hey, it would be really nice to get some cash in the door on this case this year. Let's explore perhaps selling off 
a part of that risk. So I think that's a really big thing um, is just that, you know, cash certainty is very, very attractive because firms either have to cut back during the year if there's going to be a downturn or the partners are going to have to pay it back um, at the end of the year. So, you know, for me, this message of, you know, when you're doing business development and you're telling people why they should be hedging risk, you know, the, the attractiveness of hedging risk in boom times is just not the same, right, as it is when people see the bottom line and especially something as dramatic as here. So that, that to me is really the, the biggest thing that I've seen. Uh, thank you. Do you, Ted, and then we're going to go to Matt, do you see any changes in the underwriting standards from different funders? Are they loosening standards, tightening standards, or staying about the same? So I, I haven't seen, I certainly haven't seen loosening. Um, and, you know, a case has to be good to do it because it's a huge risk. And so certainly no loosening, you know, depending on which funders you're talking to, some of them are a bit more cautious, but to be honest, they're seeing more opportunity, and they might be seeing better deals than they were. But I'd say certainly no loosening, but then, you know, on a case-by-case -case business, you know, I'm sure there are funders out there who would have happily made a $15 million bet that they really believed in in February, and today they might just say, maybe let's make two $5 million bets. But as far as the criteria for this case meeting our objectives to be a green light, certainly no loosening, certainly, certainly no loosening of those standards. Okay, thank you. Uh, Matt, how are things looking at Lex shares and in particular, because I understand that some of your investment comes through individuals saying this looks like a good case um, and that they want to actually make an investment in a particular case. Do you, is COVID-19 and the economic fallout of it impacting Lex shares and its ability to, to fund cases? Yeah, no, thanks, David. And I can sort of start with the investment piece. I think the short answer there is, is no. Uh, we actually did fund a, a $2 million case maybe a few weeks ago, right in the heart of, of all the panic. I think we actually saw more new investors than we had on any case previously. So I think more than anything, there's an appetite right now for uncorrelated assets, which makes sense. Uh, that said, though, I would agree with Ted. There, there is certainly no loosening. I would even argue to say that there's a pretty significant tightening, at least on the lect shares front. Anything exotic that we might typically entertain is really off the table. There are certain case types that are now off the table, at least for Q2. You know, those would be patent infringement, select international arbitrations, even cases or case types that I think we're in our, our case studies like trademark and, and other soft IP is really not something we're entertaining right now. You know, we sort of joke internally, we're looking for meat and potato cases. Uh, so they need to be straightforward. They need to be strong. They need to have limited collection concern. And I will tell you that makes my job a little bit harder. Uh, but that said, you know, as Ted also echoed, there is no shortage of opportunities right now. You know, there is an obvious uncertainty, and, and that has led to sort of spikes in, in really all fronts, you know, certainly on our kind of web traffic and just inbound interest through the site. You know, we get a lot of bad opportunities normally. We're getting flooded by bad opportunities now. Uh, but some of those opportunities are, are strong. Uh, there have been a few particularly, you know, above average inbound inquiries. And then I would say from sort of my network of attorneys and folks that I've cultivated relationships with now over the years, I'm arguably getting a referral a day, uh, whether it be, you know, legit or connecting to someone in the firm or whatever it is. So there is real interest. I think part of it, again, is obvious. Folks are concerned about capital. So whether they can't launch the case or now it's ongoing and, and both parties are really wondering how they're going to get this finished. But I, I do think there's some new cohorts we're seeing, larger companies that wouldn't traditionally consider this, and then also on the law firm side as well. Uh, and then from my end, so I'm certainly on the front lines of origination, no shortage. But I would say on, on the deal-making side, sort of seeing both fronts, 
Uh, on one end, there is a bit more of an urgency to get deals done, and that always helps. But on the other end, we're all at home. Decision makers are all across the world doing Zooms and whatnot. Uh, so it's a little harder sometimes to get these deals done. You know, I would say also, given our structure, where typically the multiple increases over time, and we're dealing with all of these courts closures with uncertainty on that end, you know, a lot of clients are a bit nervous to start the clock. So they might want to figure something out or see if they can settle the case. I am literally seeing that in real time on a few, you know, cases we're pursuing on the proposal front. Uh, so overall, net positive. Uh, but definitely some tricky dynamics to deal with on our end. Great. Thank you, Matt. I think that's a, a key point just to, for folks to keep in mind that most of, the, most of the deal structures include a time horizon where if it takes you longer than a certain period of time, say two years, to resolve the dispute and get it uh, fully, the, the proceeds distributed, that you may end up paying more for the money. And as a result of that, as court closures and delays are happening and, and will continue to happen, you have to take that into consideration when you're kind of structuring the deal and negotiating the terms. So I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, Ross, let us ask you that kind of the same, to comment on that same question, is, is the current environment impacting the work that you're doing at risk settlements? You know, I think Generally speaking, in the past month, we've seen, I think consistent with other parts of the economy, a bit of a, a slowdown. Um, I think generally the, the reasons why, there was a, there was a study from the an article about the National Judicial College where um, hundreds of judges reported that their courts are operating at less than a quarter of their pre-pandemic levels. And, you know, I think with the slowdown in the courts right now, what we're seeing, you know, again, in real time is the loss of litigation leverage, right? And litigation leverage in our field drives settlements. And so it could be that parties want to resolve a case before a critical decision comes out, whether it's class cert or summary judgment. And that kind of pushes parties on both sides to focus and get a deal done. And given the slowdown and the unlikelihood of, of decisions anytime soon, you know, in conjunction with the corporate belt tightening that we're seeing. And I think part of that is what, you know, Matt and Ted are seeing a little bit, that that's a reason to fund cases and get cash in the door. But it's also a reason for certain defendants to avoid having cash go out the door with respect to settlements. And so, you know, currently, um, you know, as folks are kind of getting their footing in this new world that we're living in, you know, we are seeing, I think, what's a temporary slowdown. But I think as things start to open up again, as the courts start to adjust to, um, hearings on, you know, on Zoom or on Skype or however they're going to be doing it, um, you know, settlements will pick up in time because these cases aren't going away. They're not being voluntarily dismissed and they're going to, you know, parties are going to want resolution to get this off certain uncertainty off the book. So we expect to you know, have our phone ring quite frequently in the near future, even if the past month has been a little bit slower. Great. Uh, thank you, Ross. I'll just turn it over to Kathy. Yeah, I was curious if the panel can speak a little bit to bankruptcies. Um, there's a lot of chatter and talk about, you know, an anticipation of increased bankruptcies. There's articles talking about you know, bankruptcy practices ramping up and preparing for what might be around the corner. What role do you see uh, third-party funding playing in a uh, potential uptick in bankruptcies? Um, whether it's for trustees or claims that, you know, creditors committees might want to be pushing to have brought, what role do you see that, that playing and where does that fit sort of into the scheme of the, the portfolio of cases that, that might be attractive to funders? To your point, Matt, um, you know, is that, meat, is that going to fall into the meat and potatoes cases or is that going to be um, too exotic to be a, a, a resource? I mean, Ted, I think that you had some comments on this point that you were prepared. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think bankruptcy is, is going to be very attractive because there is, is going to be a lot of it. And, you know, bankruptcy trustees realize, I mean, you need firepower. And this is, right, this is one way to get it. Um, a related part of that is, you know, when looking through an estate, you know, there are estates where some of the most valuable assets are litigation claims. And whether those are 
pending litigation claims or litigation claims that never got off the ground, I think that there is, um, there is a big role uh, for litigation funding to play. Interestingly, some parties that play around the edges of litigation funding, for example, there are hedge funds and alternative asset traders who they might not directly invest in litigation yet, but for example, there's a huge trade in people buy bankruptcy claims. Like for example, the PG&E bankruptcy in California, there is a huge market to buy and sell and price those claims. And so there are people around the litigation space that certainly see the value in these bankruptcies. And I think because there are gonna be, you know, frankly, so many of them, I really do think that there is gonna be a big role. And, you know, more importantly, I think that the funders are gonna be seeking that out and they have to price the risk, right? Just like they price anything else. Great, um, well, thank you to each of our panelists. Um, Ashley, if we could put the last slide back up so that people have contact information for everyone. I'd like to thank Matt, Ross, and Ted uh, for making time to share their insights today uh, and for being available to answer questions as we kind of prepared the presentation. Uh, to, to all of the audience members, thank you for making time to join us for the presentation as well. Uh, we will make a copy of the video available um, once, uh, I think in about 24 hours or so, we'll make a copy of the video available. We also have some articles and materials that we'll share with you in case you'd like to read more. Uh, particularly the New York Bar Report that Kathy mentioned, there's some materials about that that can help you as you kind of navigate or think about any of the ethical challenges or issues that may arise in this. But I think the takeaway from today's discussion is clear that, that litigation funding is here. It's a big part of the legal industry now and will only continue to be larger as we move forward. It can also provide, I think, businesses and firms with an opportunity to pursue valid legal claims when the resources might otherwise be constrained or if they have to, uh, to defend litigation in this context. So um, once again, thank you to everyone for participating. And if Ashley, uh, if you do get a chance, go ahead and flash the last slide up so that people have contact information for follow-up. Uh, Kathy, any, any closing comments from you? No, I think that does it. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I hope that you have some takeaways from this and uh, uh, encourage you to get to know Ted and Matt and Ross and reach out to us if you have any follow-up questions about anything we touched on today. And hope you have a great day. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.